Welcome to tonight's uh, Tanya class. We are actually studying tonight Tanya, the fourth section, Egeret HaKodesh, chapter 11, Perik Yud Aleph. Now, as always, every single chapter in Tanya, because it's the Bible of mysticism, has its own powerful message and a strong message. Now, some say that this chapter in Tanya happens to be the most powerful, transforming chapter in Tanya. And this, cha- this chapter can literally change your life, put you in a whole different level, and you know, I always look for what's the, in a nutshell, what is this chapter teaching us? And this chapter of Tanya, chapter 11, Igerita Kodesh, is teaching you, you ready for this? That life is amazing. Hello. Isn't that a great chapter? Yes. Well, I'm intrigued. Okay, there you go. Einstein said that either everything's a miracle or nothing is a miracle. Isn't that beautiful? I get it. Thank you, thank you. But here's the point. Chapter 11, Igerita Kodesh, famous, famous chapter. The altar teaches us how life is amazing. Now, when we say life is amazing, life means from when we're born till we die, everything in between. Life, life is amazing. Now, if you can actually experience it and feel it, whoa, now your life is amazing. And here the author is the, teaches us how we can literally live the most amazing and powerful life. Now, we all know everything has pros and cons in life. Because the author was teaching us how powerful this concept is, that life is amazing, so I'm going to start off by a disclaimer and saying as follows, that we're going to learn this chapter is extremely powerful, And therefore, this is something, hopefully, you can study it, comprehend it, and you can get it and appreciate it, and this will change your life. But I will tell you as a disclaimer, please don't try to lecture this to somebody else if they're not holding on that level, because it's powerful stuff. And if someone's not holding on that level where, where they're ready to appreciate and accept the fact that life is amazing, they're going through some pain and suffering and challenge, and you come to them and say, hey, the altar says in chapter 11 that life is amazing, that can be very, very painful and very hurt, hurtful. So basically it's prescription only. Exactly. It is, yes, absolutely. Yes, I like that. Very good. It's prescription only to the person that studies it and gets it. So I would encourage you to... Sp- Listen, study, hopefully you get it on your own, and you can start living an amazing life. But God forbid, you should not, God forbid, judge someone that they're not living a life as amazing, and you shouldn't lecture somebody. But hopefully you can inspire them, hey, study it. Maybe you'll appreciate the prescription, and it'll work for you. I know, like, for example, it works for me. Try it. It might work. I hope it does. But it's really something that someone has to uh, be willing to study, meditate it, and you will experience that life is amazing. So again, remember the disclaimer. Don't judge and don't lecture anyone else because this is powerful stuff. It's powerful stuff because the effect is very powerful, but you have to be willing and ready to um, take the prescription. Okay. So the algebra starts off with two words. The two words are actually taken from the prophet, the book, Daniel. You know, it's a book of prophecy, Daniel, where the angel, Gabriel, came to the prophet Daniel, and he told him two words. The words he told him was, and this is the opening of the chapter in Tanya, Lahaskilcha bina, which means that the prophet is going to teach. I'm sorry, the angel, Gabriel, is going to teach Daniel. He's going to teach him understanding. La skill comes from the word haskala, to, to teach, to, under, to comprehend. He's going to teach him bina understanding. That's how the altar opens this chapter. A quote from the prophet Daniel, which is a prophecy that an, the, the angel Gabriel told the prophet, la skill bina, I'm going to teach you understanding. And that's what the altar is coming to tell us. The altar is going to teach us understanding. God, the altar is going to teach us Bina understanding. Which type of understanding? We know there's Chachma, not that. There's Das, and there's part of it in it. But the key thing is Bina. So you see here what the altar is teaching us is that the key to this concept that life is amazing lies in what? Lahaskilcha Bina, if we get the Bina part. And the altar is going to explain to us what the Bina is as we go through the chapter. But what's interesting is. 
Lahaskilcha is, we know in, in, in the Hebrew language, there's the singular and there's the plural. Lahaskilcha is singular. Th- think about the prophet. I mean, the angel. The angel Gabriel was coming to the prophet Daniel, Lahaskilcha, he was going to teach him who that specific prophet. So seemingly, the altar was writing the Tanya to who? To one individual or to everybody? To everybody. To everyone. So why does he use a term, Lahaskilcha, singular, when it should be, find something that he's trying to teach, plural, to everybody. And here you see that the altruist specifically uses a singular term, because this is not something that everybody will be willing and ready and able to accept. So it's really a lesson to each, to an individual. But on the other hand, if it's an individual, why, why is he putting it in the book of Tanya, which is published to everybody? And the answer is both. Because it's an individual lesson to everybody. This is something which is a personal lesson to each and every one of us. That means the whole world can learn this chapter, but it's individualized to you, to what you're ready to accept, and what you're ready to embrace, and how much do you appreciate. So la skilcha means this is a, like you said before, it's a specific, what was it, prescription, prescription. to each individual, but then again, it's to everybody, because it's, it's available to everybody. It's generic. Correct, yes. We need now, to be ready to receive it. Okay, so that is the opening statement. The altar is going to teach us Bina, and he starts as follows. In life, what do we want? We want to live a happy, Joy- peaceful, peaceful, joyful, godly light. Now, so in other words, what's the term the altar re- uses? What we really want is we want to be living, like for example, does anybody want to be homeless? God forbid. We want a home. Matter of fact, according to the Kabbalah, mysticism, if you don't have a home, you're not a human being. So oh, you all want a home. Now, do you want to have a broken down home? God forbid? No. Or we live in Florida. Do you want a home without air conditioning? Yeah. And, and with, with mosquitoes? That's not a home. You want a home that has windows, that has air conditioning. I'm talking on a physical level. That has, right? There's no mosquito. You want a clean, neat, uh, fresh air, not polluted from unfortunately we have now in Florida, south of Florida, the algae. We don't want any of the algae stuff. We want to have a healthy environment, physically, spiritually, etc. So what we really want is, the author says, we want to dwell. What's the greatest um, ear that we can have? The greatest place to dwell, besides physically in a clean environment, we want to have a, to live in the light of God. Because if you're living in the light of God, guess what? You got a mate. If you're living, and every moment, God's light is on, like if you're living in a house, and it's the middle of the night, and there's no electricity, you'll be bumping your head into walls, into who knows what. But as the light is on, you can access whatever you have to. Now, the same thing also on a spiritual level. You can be walking around, and you're spiritually dark. You're unhappy, you're depressed, etc. What kind of life is that? But on the other hand, if the light of God is on, and you're glowing, whoa, now we're talking. So what a person really wants is to be dwell in the light of Hashem. That's the goal, or at least one of the goals. And we have that, then we can do everything. We can pray, we can study, we can do mitzvot, we can have a great life, a happy life, we can have a great family, community, all the wonderful stuff. So what we really want is we want to have the Oyer Hashem to be upon us. So the altar says, great, I'm going to teach you how to have that. Because oh. when the Oyer Hashem is on you, is your life good, amazing, or it's like beyond? All the above, right? So the optimist is like this. And here's like a fine line. What do we want? He, the optimist lists three things. We want to live. We want life. We want a family. Children, for example. And we want to have what to eat. Life means a healthy life. Physically, spirit. We want to live. We want children. We want a family. And we want to be able to nourish ourselves. Now, here comes up and he says like this, why do you want that? There's two reasons why you can want that. What do you mean? I want to live. I want to have a family, my kids, right? I want to eat. So it tastes good. I'll just know. If you're doing it for that reason, you, you're never going to have the light of the Shekhinah on you. Doesn't mean you shouldn't want to live, and doesn't mean you shouldn't want to have kids, or a family, and food. You should want that stuff, but not for that reason, because you want it, and it tastes good, and it feels good, and it's, it's mine. That's not the reason. You should want it because it is the Ratzon Hashem. That's what God wants. In other words, if you're doing something for your sake, who's in control? You are. 
And guess what? If you are, that's wonderful. But you're not going to have the light of Hashem. But if you're doing it because God wants you to do it, then what light are you going to have in your life? You're going to have the light of Hashem. And the altar quotes, for example, from the Ethics of the Fathers, where it says, fascinating line, Al karchach atachai, against your will you're living. What does it mean, against your will you're living? That means, really, I have no interest in this world. I, have no, I don't need to be here. I'd rather be with God. Pray, study, meditate, cleave to God, be one with God. So what am I doing here? You know why I'm here? Because God put me in this world, and because he put me here, I guess i got to be here. And i got to pray, and i got to study, i got to do mitzvot, i got to deal with the materialistic world, i got to deal with problems, challenges, whatever it is. But I'm here as what? As an emissary of God. And that is the idea of al kar I don't want to be here. I'm here because God put me here. If God put me I'm going to do the best job I can with the tools that God gave me. Now, once a person does that, are you living because you want to live and you're enjoying life? Or are you living as an emissary of God? You're living as an emissary of God. So therefore, once you're living as an emissary of God, the only reason why you're here and you're doing what you're doing is one reason, one reason only. What is the reason? Because God put me here. Now, so the answer is, how do we know, how do you know, right? Because we said it's a prescription for yourself. How do you know if I'm online with doing for I want or am I actually doing for God wants? Because ultimately, I want to have the, the light of Hashem to be on me. So in order for the light of Hashem to be upon me, I have to be doing it for God wants. So how do I know that I'm living because God wants me to live versus I want it? Or I have a family because God wants me to bring children into this world versus I want to have my children? Or I'm eating because God wants me to sustain myself versus, no, I'm eating because I enjoy it, it's my food, etc. And the author gives a very simple example. Make believe... If God took away any of the three things from you, in these examples, it could be other things as well. For example, your health is not the greatest. Or having children, or having difficult children, challenging children, etc. Or, for example, you're having a hard time earning a living. How do you feel about it? Very simple. If it's because you want it, and now you don't have it, how are you going to feel? Not great. I want it. Where is it? But if the only reason why you want it is not because you want it, because God wants me to have it. So if God doesn't want me to have it, He doesn't want me to have it. It's okay. It's okay. Because it's not about me that I want it. And if I don't have it, I'm upset. What does God want? I'm ready to do it. Obviously, God shows the health shouldn't be the, life shouldn't be the best and the greatest. Okay, that's what God wants. Family issues, sustenance issues, etc. That ultimately is the key. Now, if you're able to really be in that place, that's wonderful. So now the author says, great. Ultimately, what do we want? We want to have the, 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 the light of God to be upon us. And the way the light of God is going to be upon us when we realize it's not about what we want, it's really what Hashem wants. So now the author says, how can we reach that level that we're going to live a life of joy and freedom? How do we reach that level where we're going to want to do things only because God wants us to do them? So the altar teaches us a beautiful meditation. And everyone loves meditation. Here you have right here. You don't have to go look anywhere else. Right here, this chapter, the altar teaches you meditation. He says like this. We need to think and meditate a few things. Number one is, who created this world? And we all know the answer. God created the world. But we have to not only know it as something in the past, or know it as a piece of knowledge, but we have to actually comprehend it. In other words, we know Chabad, right? We're called Chabad. Why are we called Chabad? Because it refers to the three levels of intellect. Chachma, which is the ideas, data. Bina is already the details of it. And Das is the application and where we connect to it. So the opposite first thing is like this. Who created the world? God created the world. Who's constantly maintaining the world? God. So the author is like this. When we take, let's go back to the first two words in the, author, in the chapter of Tanya, the, uh, the author was going to teach us Bina. When we take our Bina, and we think in detail and in depth, and all the components of the way God created the world, and God is right now maintaining the world, 
And not only the world, my world, myself, my family, my community, everything that's around me, I am only here right now because God created me and maintains me. That's Bina. Bina is, that's what I'm thinking about, in depth. Then, once we comprehend it and we're thinking about that, what? God created the world and maintains the world. So it's still data, but it's a lot more detailed data versus Chachma. Now you have to use Das. What is Das? And the author teaches us Das is very powerful. Das is when we start imagining it. We create this like image in our, in our mind. We create 3D, 4D, even more than 4D. We create literally, we're able to literally see in the world of imagination that actually try to bring it into reality that, whoa, right now God has not only created me past tense, but right now God has given me my breath. I'm breathing. I'm thinking, I'm talking, I'm here, I'm present. Everything in my life, God is making it happen. So not only Bina do we comprehend it, but Das, we start imagining it. God is not something out there. God is literally part of my life right now. What will happen is, as you start using Bina and Das, starts off with Bina, comprehending it, and then Das, what are you going to start experiencing? Literally, experience. What are you going to experience? You're going to experience God. You're going to experience God. Now, who is God? Let's go back to the comprehension, the Bina and the Das. God is the source of my life. It's not that, oh, I'm going to pray to God. We need to God. Hello, to God? It's as if I'm me. I'm going to pray to God. Hello, I wouldn't be if God didn't create me and maintain me. So am I going to pray to God? It's not to something else. I'm going to pray to God. I'm going to pray God. God is the life of the world. Now, this God who created me and maintains me, and while you're in the meditation of Bina and Das, is this God good? Yes. Is it even a question? Hello, he created you. He's maintaining you. Is he good? Sure he's good. I don't know when it's good. Sure he's good. I wouldn't be here if he wasn't good. If God was selfish, I wouldn't be here. He'd be busy playing golf. Right? Or going out to the movies. I don't know what he'd be busy doing. But he didn't play golf. Maybe he does also. <laughs> right? But he, he's actually, at this second, in this moment, he, crea he created me past. He's maintaining me. He's so is he good or not good? Sure, he's great. Not only is he good... Let's go a step further. Is God a loving God? Yes. A God that loves me? Yes. Full of pleasure? Sure. He created me. Sure he's full of pleasure. Right? Not only that, God is like the highest level, the epitome of Aden, of the greatest enjoyment, the greatest joy that exists in the world, God, God is. Now, if God is so powerful, and God is so good, and God is so loving and you're in this meditation, and realizing that God is all good, is there any room for anything bad, pain, suffering in that space? No. No. You got it. In that space, if you're focused right now, Bina, right, you're thinking about it, Das, when God created me, creates me, maintains me, this good and loving God who's so lovable and so enjoyable, and I am here right now thanks to Him, I'm enveloped with his warmth and his love, right? Is there any pain and suffering? Do you think that God would create pain, suffering? I didn't want to say the words. Absolutely not. My pain is gone. Your pain is gone. We just healed her. Anyone else want to come up? <laughs> come up. We'll heal you, right? Can you get a witness? <laughs> it, it goes away. It goes away. Like we have a witness right here. There you go. Anyone else want to sit down here? We'll heal you right now. Okay. But, and it's the truth. Think about it. You literally trans because you're you're feeling the greatest level of, of joy and happiness now. Yeah. So, but it's important to know the opposite. What is the enemy? What causes us the greatest pain and suffering? I just showed you on the positive side, and let's hold on to that. And that's great. That, well, that's the goal. But you have to know the enemy. What is the enemy that causes us to feel pain and suffering? So the answer is very simple. Let's look at the opposite. Yeah. Let's look at the opposite. 
What happens when we experience something that does not make sense to us? Now let's describe it. We have a mind. We have a mind. Our mind tells us one plus one is two. Two plus two is four. Now what happens when we, we experience or we see something or we hear something which doesn't make sense and is full of pain and uh, confusion, etc.? What happens? What do we use? We use the same Bina, right? The same Bina the author was teaching us, taught us before, and use it in the positive to think about the way God created, created the world and maintains us, and God is good and loving, that re- causes us to have Das and have that great experience, which causes us to be in this, like, whoa, all loving God. But if we use that same tool, Bina, which is just a tool, and we start thinking about things that don't make sense, right? We think, oh my gosh, that doesn't make sense. That's terrible. And one plus one, oh my gosh, it's three. That's what you came up with through your Bina, because Bina can do that, do that to you. It's data. What happens then? It spirals. Then your das, your imagination, picks up on what? Where it doesn't make sense. And your imagination picks up where it's pain and suffering. And guess what happens? Now your imagination takes you to a place of what? Bad, pain, suffering, torture, jealousy, hate, envy, etc. Whoa. Literally, literally the same tools. Bina, Das, what you loaded into Bina, which was on the right side, oh my gosh, God created me, maintains me, which is the truth, right? And you start imagining that, it's wonderful, and you took away your pain. But if I, on the other hand, take data that things are terrible and bad, and, and we put loaded into the Bina, and then we start imagining that, what happens now to you? You start feeling what? Pain again. Oh my gosh, she's now in pain. Look at that. Look at that. In this. Envy. And you start feeling the pain, envy. Where did it all happen? It all happened, as Albert told us last skill cut to teach you, with Bina, how Bina is so powerful. Because what you load in the gun of Bina, that's going to get you to your das, your imagination, and that's going to get the experience, which was either positive in the first hand, or God forbid, negative on the second hand. So now the question is what's really the truth? What's really the truth? Is the truth that everything is good, like in the first example, and she was feeling great, or is the truth that really things don't make sense and you should start feeling terrible, which I don't want you to do that. But what's really the truth? What's the truth? So the author says like this. The truth is, Emes, and we know God's seal is truth, that anything and everything that comes from Hashem is all good. Now again, I want you to remember the disclaimer from the beginning. Don't preach this to anybody. Either you buy it, and you own it, and it will change your life. And when someone's ready to study this on their own and really get into it, it will help them. But you can't say to someone, you're complaining? Ha! Look at chapter 11 and... and no, no, don't do that. Please, I'm begging by you. Okay, but on the other hand, if someone say, listen, you know, it worked for me, why don't you try it? Go study it. All right, back to the point. So I'll give you something like this. What's the truth? The truth is that everything that comes from God is what? Is good. Everything that comes from God is great. Now... But we said before, so in the first case, he loaded the gun, life is great, God created me, he maintains me, I'm so happy, life is wonderful, I imagine this beautiful world, and I feel healed, I feel happy. But what happened, hold on a second, the other person wasn't dreaming, they came to the conclusion, things don't make sense, things are bad, things are awful. What does that mean? So the author says, very, very simple, the truth is that everything from God is all good, and God wants to give us good, he didn't create us to give us Pain and suffering. God didn't put us in this world to give us pain and suffering. God's intention, we should have a great life. But the problem is, sometimes this good that God gives us tastes good. Like, for example, you pick up a sweet candy, right? It's sweet. But the reality, is it really good for you? Debatable. It might be actually ruining your teeth. You'll need cavities. On the other hand, if you eat something which is sharp and bitter, I don't know, an onion, a hot pepper, you might say, oh my gosh, it's bitter. But is it really good for you? Absolutely cleans your blood, and so on and so forth. But what happens is, everything really from God is good, but sometimes it doesn't make sense. You know why? Because it's coming from a very high level of good. It's coming from a very, very great place of good that God wants to give us. And for some reason, for some reason, we don't see the good, but the truth, emes. Emes means what is the truth? Is it good or not good? And the author says, yes, a hundred is good. And we all know the famous story in the Talmud, but the famous rabbi, his name was Nachum Ish Gamzu. Why was he called Nachum Ish Gamzu? His name was Nachum. But Ish, they called him the man of Gamzu, because he always said, Gamzu, this is good. 
And this is another expression that whatever God does is for the good. It means it's good. We don't see it good, but it's probably for the good. No, no, this is for the good. What's the famous story? They sent him with a gift to the king, and inside the gift was a, a box of jewels. And on his journey to bring it to the king, the box of jewels, he wakes up one morning and opens up the box, and he goes, look, oh my gosh, he was robbed. Someone took out the jewels, but didn't want him to notice it, so they filled it with what? With sand. You imagine you bring the king a present of sand? Hey. What's going to happen to you? Chopped meat for dinner, right? Uh, steaks? What's going to happen to you? But what did Nachum Ishkam do say? His line was always, this is for good. Not, this is good. He said, no, 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 I'm going to the king. You're going to the king, you're going to bring him sand? What's that all about? I was sent, I'm bringing it. Now, some might argue and say, you're a fool, don't do that. Go back and find more jewels. He said, no, 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 this is for the God, because whatever God does is for the good. This, do I see it? No. But I know from God it's all for the good. What happened at the end? He went there, and the king got upset, but someone said, no, no, no. The rabbis wouldn't insult you. The Jews wouldn't insult you. It's probably very, very special sand, right? And guess what? At the next time we have to go to war, we're going to use it. It may be Abraham's magical sand, because everyone knows that Abraham fought war. He would pick up sand from the, from the earth, and he would throw it. It would turn into um, uh, swords, yeah. ammunition, and he, that's how he won all his wars. You think Abraham had a factory that made bullets? No. He had God, and if he went out to war, he went to war. He had no ammunition, but so he picked up sand, and he threw the sand, and the sand worked as ammunition. So they told him, this must be Abraham's sand. And sure enough, the king used it, and they won the war. They won the war. What does that mean? Nacham Ish Gamzu said, whatever happens from God is good. Gamzu Latova. This is all for the good. It's all for the good. So once you're saying it's all for the good, guess what? It's all for the good. So the author says that when we go through life, whatever happens to us, if it makes sense, wonderful. And if it doesn't make sense, it's still good? Yes, it's from a higher level of good. We don't see it. But it's even a question for sure it's good. So in other words, author says, if we want to experience that life is good, what do we need to work on? One thing. What's that one thing? We need to work on I'll say it in Hebrew, I'll translate it, and I'll explain it. We need to work on our emuna. We need to work on our faith. What's our faith? Very simple. That Hashem is weird everywhere, and Hashem is in everything, and everything that comes from God is all 100% good. There is nothing negative in the world, and if there's a negative... The negative will be transformed into positive. And this idea that we have faith that everything is good, this will give us real strength. This will give us real joy and we'll be able to live a great life. So therefore, and the author puts down 101 how to live life. And he gives you marching orders. Based on this meditation, that life, everything is good, and the truth is it's good. Not only, this one says it's good, no, the truth is it's all good. So the author puts down marching orders. The first thing the author says is, you ready for this? These are the marching orders. This is how you get up every day, and this is how you live throughout the day. The first thing the author says is, the first thing every single day quantitatively, from, the, from when you get up, qualitatively, your outlook on life has to be, a person has to be happy. Done. Marching orders. So if a person walks around with a smile, He's doing what the altar was said. If God forbid you not, hello, go back and study this again, if you're willing to accept it. What does the altar say? A person has to always be happy. Wake up happy. Wake up happy, go to sleep happy, during the day you're happy. There's never a moment you should not be happy. Why? Very simple. God is good. God created the world. He created you. He maintains you. God is good. So what do you, hello, be happy. We're all on board. You're holding on to your bicycles. Hold on tight. Then he says, you're happy? Yes. Big smiles? Okay. Now you're going to go further. Now you're going to start celebrating. Not enough to be happy. Celebration time. Not just when there's a wedding or bar mitzvah, or when there's a kiddush in shul, a big kiddush. You have to be celebrating when? Always. Don't wait for a moment to celebrate. Yeah. The author says a person has to be happy always. 
and you have to celebrate always. What are you celebrating? You're going to say, what, what is this guy so happy about? What are you so happy? And you're breathing. What are you so happy about? And you're happy and that very simple. What do you mean? I am happy and I am celebrating because God, the infinite God, created me, gave me life, and he gave me goodness when? Not yesterday, not tomorrow, every single moment. Every single moment. Now the doctor was, takes the flip side. So what the doctor would say, we have to be happy, we have to be celebrating that life is good, and God is good to us, and we're alive. So that's just the flip side. If somebody, God forbid, is walking around unhappy, and not dancing and not celebrating, uh, or God forbid saying, oh my gosh, it's terrible, and he's suffering, uh, not that we're judging other people, we're talking about ourselves, but the other thing, what you're really doing is, you're actually denying, denying God's existence. Hello, you're denying God's existence, because how do you come up being sad and suffering? What are you saying? God doesn't exist? That's what you're saying? Because if God does exist, and He created you, maintains you, and God is good, so where does it come from? And therefore, based on this, the al says, this is heavy stuff, that in the world of Kabbalah, there is zero tolerance and zero room for sadness. Not, I'm not even going to say 50% or 10% or 1%, zero. There's zero room for sadness, because if you believe that God exists, and God created you, maintained you, and God is good, where's, where's the sadness come from? We should have only one dial in our life. You know, in the stereo system, you have all these channels, you have 100 channels. You don't need all these 100 channels. You need one channel. You know what the channel is? G-O-D. God channel, which basically translates to happy and celebration. There's, that's the only channel that exists. But the altruist says, hold on a second. I get it. Heavy stuff. You want to be happy and celebrate. But there's pain. Sometimes there's pain and suffering. And again, remember, we're talking about our own pain and suffering. Other people's, we have to be, have empathy for them, right? So he says very simple. Because some a person of faith, a person of faith, when a person's lacking, when you feel pain, suffering, or lacking, you have to say, no, no, no. I have and I don't have, it's all the same thing. I'm going to be happy, I'm going to celebrate, I have and I don't have, it's the same thing. And the author quotes the famous teaching of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov explains like this, it says, Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Summit. I have to place God in front of me always. That's the simple translation. What does the, what does the Baal Shem Tov translate? Shivisi comes from the word, it's equal. Equal. So the Balshantov explains that if God is in front of me, if God is in my life, if I being you know, I get it, and I think about and I, and I meditate about God that He's in my life, God is in my life, always Shivisi. Life is equal. Good, bad, it's all the same thing. You should sell. Have, don't have, it's all the same thing. I'm still gonna be happy and what? And still gonna be gonna I'm, I'm still gonna celebrate. And celebrate. Exactly. <laughs> now the only thing that's going to hold you back from that is if you start loving self more. If it's about me, then I stop making these calculations. So what you need to do is say, turn it over. Hey, God created the world, God maintains the world, and that's it. Now, the algorithm says that in this world that we're living in, God creates tests for us. What's the test? Very simple. And the, the root of every test is one question. Is God running the world, or am I running the world? If God's running the world, life is great. Life is wonderful. I'm going to be happy celebration. If, God forbid, I'm running the world, guess what? <laughs> sometimes I'm going to be happy, and sometimes, unfortunately, not going to be happy. So in other words, the Altarist says that the goal of our life is to realize Me Hashem Mitzadei Gever Kernone, to realize that everything happens to us every single step of our life, every single moment of our life, everything comes from Hashem. And if and when we're able to accept and realize that God runs the world, may Hashem, everything comes from Hashem, then we will be able to experience what? Life is amazing when? Always. 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 24-7. Now, what happens at times we can't comprehend it? 
The Bina is lacking. We have this thing, oh my gosh, it doesn't make sense. Pain and suffering. Again, personal. We're talking about ourselves, never judging anyone else. What do we need to do? We practice Amuna, then it's all good. And it's a good that we don't, we don't comprehend. We don't get it. I get it. Maybe one plus one, for some reason, I'm getting number four. But I know that one plus one is supposed to equal two. I know that this world is supposed to be great. And everything that comes from God is good. Now, and here's the author teaches us something very, very powerful. Very powerful. What happens, you're going through a challenge. You're going through a difficult time. But you right away hold on to your faith and say, you know what, I'm going through a tough time right now. Challenging, doesn't make sense, confusing, painful, etc. But I'm going to have faith that what? God created the world, God created me, God maintains me, it's all good. And even though it doesn't make sense, but I'm going to accept that it's all good, I'm going to put on a big smile, I'm going to be happy, and I'm going to celebrate. You know, you, know, you, know, you know what's going to happen? There's something very, very magical. And the author uses the word. The bad that we perceive. See, because what the author would say is the truth is, is everything good? Yes. So when there's bad and pain and suffering, according to the author, is that real or perceived? It's perceived. It's perceived. It's not even real. It's perceived. So what happens is when we have faith that it's really good, we take the perceived bad and we elevate it to the high level of good which is hidden. Because it's revealed good and hidden good. When we take perceived bad and we're still faithful, and we're still happy, and we still celebrate, we took a perceived bad, not taking a real bad, a real pain, a, real, a perceived bad, and you elevate it to the highest level of good. Now what's interesting is, we all know that in the world of Judaism, there's always leaders, spiritual leaders, people coach you for advice. And um, there's a story told that the uncle of the Rebbe, the uncle of the Rebbe, once went through a terrible tra tragedy. No one should know for this, because we know the Talmud says, the worst pain a person can suffer is unfortunately burying your own children. Parents pass away, it's painful. Get it. Siblings, spouses, but when your own child passes, it's the worst pain. The worst pain. So the Rebbe's uncle lost his own, own child. And he came at that time to the fifth Chabad Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab. And he told him the pain is, like, unbearable. He just can't handle it. Even though he learned and, you know, uh, he knows God is good, but he's, it's not working for him. So the Atari told him, the, the Rebbe Rashab told him, to study this chapter in Tanya. And that actually healed him. It was able to take him out, God forbid, from like a declining possible depression and going to melancholy and sadness and was able to transform him. Wow. The Rebbe Rashab didn't tell him it's good. He said, study this. You're a smart man. God gave you a soul. Study it. And by him studying it, he was able on his own you can't tell someone, oh my gosh, it's all good. God forbid, they lost a child. Hello? No, you have to be, I feel bad. It's terrible. I feel your pain. And it's real. But you can say, listen, study it. You might find something, a godly light that, that will work. And it worked for him. And he was able to experience um, uh, uh, happiness, even amidst of all the pain and all the suffering. So I think this chapter of Tanya, chapter 11 in Igor Tekodesh, is really, really, again, a very, very powerful chapter that will allow you to live a life that is happy, celebratory, amazing, when always. By literally a simple guidance of the altar to teach you how to meditate on the truth, on the emes, that, and use the, the, the bina that you have, that God is great, God is good, God created us, God maintains us. God is really, everything is good. Sometimes it's, we see the good, and that's great. Sometimes we don't see the good, and it doesn't make sense. But we do have the gift of faith, and we're able to hold on to faith and realize that everything is really good. Then what happens, Alpha says, even to perceive bad, that God forbid can cause us the bina to the das, which will take us to the negative place, will get transformed into something really, really great, and we'll be able to live beautiful and great lives. And remember, this is something which, try not to preach it, but... Just live it. And people will see you living a happy life. They'll say, where did you get that from? I want that. And you'll say, you know what? Take the Tanya, study it, go on YouTube. You can listen to the class. And if it talks to you, guess what? You'll have what I have. Take two, call me in the morning. Take two, call me in the morning. Exactly. Listen to the YouTube twice. Um, anyways, I think this chapter is really, really beautiful. It's an amazing chapter. It will give us an opportunity to live a happy and amazing life.